First, errands. When you come to writing a book, it seems an absolutely huge task, an immense task. So how, how do you even start? In this video, I'm gonna show you how to write a book faster than you ever thought possible by giving it a clear structure. Working from home today, and home is the car. There are a lot of reasons you might wanna write a book. It can boost your business, it can sell your services, it can increase your profile at work, it can help you spread your message. And frankly, it's just immensely satisfying to hold your book in your hand. So why aren't you doing it? The number one reason that people give me when I ask this question, why I haven't yet written your book yet, is I don't have time. Let me tell you now, that is a complete myth. And it's a myth that might be stopping you from achieving one of the most satisfying things you ever do in your life. Completely aside from the fact it's gonna help your business, raise your profile, all of those things, we all have a book in us. You start by structuring your book. That sounds easy to say, but how? How do you structure a book? You're talking about 70, 80, 100,000 words. Probably the biggest thing you've ever prepared in your life. How do you manage all of that material? Well, don't obsess about the scale of it. What we need to do is really break it down. And the fastest way to break it down that I know is to write the table of contents. In other words, structure the reader's journey on one single sheet of paper, and it is possible. That is the way that you structure a book. And what you can do then, once you've got your table of contents, is that you write each chapter, you can write it in sequence, it's my preferred way, or you can write the chapters that sort of appeal to you and then assemble it all. Either way, you have a structure, you have something that holds the, the body of work that you have to do together. So. This is what we're gonna do in this video. I'm gonna show you how to write a table of contents because then you've structured your book. Let's back up for a second. The table of contents, what is that exactly? Well, it's a list of the chapters in your book, the sections of your book, and it's the journey that you take your reader on. It's probably the first thing you look at when you take a book off the shelf and you open it up, you want to see what's in the book, what's the plan for the book. So a writing, writing the table of contents up front gives you a cast iron structure for your book. Hi. Oh, ow. Errands over. Now, now we can do this. This is from the very brilliant Bricks and Base Plates. Lego. Everything ready? Actually, no, I need a pair of scissors. Oh, are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Not sure I'm gonna be doing that again. Oh, it's a bit hot. Oh. When you look in any book, when you look in any table of contents, you'll see two chapters, the introduction and the conclusion. And they're always there. Put them to one side. The difficult part comes between the introduction and the conclusion. There's so much material, there's so many things that you can include. What do you include? What do you leave out? On my very first day at work at Reed Elsevier, the Anglo-Dutch publishing company, people who published The Lancet, Computer Weekly, New Scientist, a lot of women's magazines as well, I was taught by Pete Mitchell, a very dour northerner, North uh, northern English guy. He said there are only three questions you need to know as a, as a reporter. He told me the three questions. And the first question is, what's up? Que paso, my friends in Spain would say. Second question, so what? And the third question, what now? I've used those three questions for years in every possible situation to run meetings, to help people decide what to do. And now I use these three questions to write books. So here's what I suggest. I suggest that you have nine chapters in between the introduction and the conclusion, nine chapters, because then you've got an 11 chapter, 10, 11, 12 chapter book, something like that. That's a realistic size for your book. So introduction, conclusion, and nine chapters in the middle. So what are those nine chapters? Well, the first three chapters deal with the question, what's up? They spell out, what is the context facing us right now? What just changed? Here's the first of the three chapters. So what's the context facing us right now? The second chapter in this section, who does this most affect 
and why. And clearly it most affects the key readers for the book. The third chapter in this section is what will happen unless something changes. And that goes here. So the first section of your non-fiction book, dealing with the question, what's up, what's the situation? This is dealing with the new normal. So chapter one is what's the current context facing us right now? What changed? The second chapter is who does this most affect and why? And the third chapter is what will happen unless we change what we do? That is the entirety of the first third of your book. Intro. These are new bricks, I can't make them work. Intro, section one, done. Now we need to look at the three chapters in the middle part of the book. And this middle part of the book answers the question, so what? So now we're looking at what are the options facing us? The first chapter in this middle section of your book is what are the options facing us? What could we do? The second chapter in this middle section is how will these options affect the future context? We're looking at a kind of a risk analysis. And the third chapter in this middle section is what's on our short list of options? Which of the options that we've discussed so far will have the greatest impact? We're not necessarily saying that's our recommendation. We're looking at creating a short list of say two or three options that will have the greatest impact and the least risk. So here we have the intro and part one of the book, What's Up? And here we have part two, the middle part of the book, dealing with so what? This is about options. What could we do now? And now we've broken the back of the book. We know what the book is going to start out with. We know what the introduction is. We know what the uh, current context is. And we know what the options are facing the readers of the book. Let's put that down for a second. The final part of the book is about what now? What decisions are we going to make? What steps are we going to take? What actions will we take? So chapter one of this final part of the book is how do we choose what to do now? What are our choice criteria? The second chapter in this final part of the book is analyzing the options that we came up with at the end of the middle part of the book. We analyze the options and we ask, what are the implementation issues? How practical are these different options? And the final chapter in this final part of the book, what are we going to do now? This is where you make your final recommendations to the reader. Introduction, what's up, so what, what now? The world just changed. This is how the current context has changed. This is the new norm. Here are the options. This is what we could do now. This is what we recommend you do now. And then a final conclusion that summarizes everything that we've just told them. This final piece is about the new, new normal. Can you see how we've taken the reader on this amazing, thoughtful journey from the new normal, the new context facing us, the different options, the different things they could do? Then we're helping them to decide what now, what to do now. And finally, ramming home those final recommendations and conclusions, remembering that we've got to win their hearts as well as their minds. And you know what? We've got a coherent story here, but just look at What's left over? There's a, there's a whole host of things that you haven't included because you know so much more than the reader. This process of creating a structure, a table of contents for the book at the very outset helps you to write the book very, very quickly. It helps you to choose what to include and what to leave out. This is a powerful strategy in itself. It's not just a piece of furniture that you need in the book. It's a process, a strategy for designing your book. And it gives the reader a very clear journey from here's the new normal to here's the new, new normal. Let's take a look at a few examples of great tables of contents. I'll clean it up later. This is Leadership Unplugged. It's the first leadership book we wrote uh, 17, 18 years ago now. And what I want to show you is that although it's based on this three-part structure, 
uh, it's actually much more uh, complex than that. So the, the, the point I want to make is that once you've got this key idea in your head of three core sections of your book, then you can uh, play tunes on it. You can, you can change what you, what you do. So here is uh, chapter one, what is leadership unplugged? Um, here's chapter two, which introduces the key model for the book, debate, discussion, and dialogue. So that's not really uh, what's up, so what, what now? It is, though, a part of a process. Communication starts off with a debate, then you begin a discussion where, where you trade shots with the other person that you're communicating with, the other team, the other organization, and finally you get into true dialogue. So it is a, a process. It is three stages, if you like. So I've got two chapters here functioning as an introduction. And then part one, the debate has uh, one, to, that only has two chapters in it before you get into part two, discussion, which has one, two, three, four chapters in the middle section. And finally, you have part three, which has dialogue, uh, chapter 10, one, two, three, um, and then a, a, a final conclusion, 12. So once you've got this core idea of three broad sections in a book, then you can ignore my rule and do what is necessary for the content that you have. Let's take another look at a, a, at a book that's structured in three sections. This is The New Rules of Living Longer by my sister-in-law, Yvonne Sonsino, Director of Innovation at Mercer. And what you'll see here is that we've got, um, this is, frankly, it's about the work-life revolution. So here's the introductory chapter. And then part one is about living longer. It's about the increasing longevity that we all have. Part two is about working longer. So it's the implications of our longer lives. And finally, part three is the new rules. So we've got one introductory chapter, two in part one, two chapters in part two, and then three in part three, before you have also the conclusion. So nine chapters in all, but still a three-part structure. There's another book here called Teaching and Learning at Business Schools. It's a really great exploration of the strategies of engaging in education worldwide. It's about 10 years old now, and I'm involved with the International Teachers Program who put this together to reprint this and make it available to a new generation of, uh, of, of educators. But what's fascinating to me is that there are an immense number of chapters, 23 chapters in this book, but actually it's only divided into two parts. So we've got part one, what happens inside the classroom, and then there are some different aspects to that, setting the stage, teaching techniques, dealing with different contexts, and part two is outside the classroom. So you don't have to stick even with three parts. You can have two parts of your book. Here's another book that Jackie and I wrote together. It's Leadership FM on leadership in the facilities management industry. And really it started out as a, as a history, as a modest history of the facilities management industry. My original doctoral research was on companies in the FM industry. So the structure of this book is, well, how did the industry found, you know, the founding of the industry. And then we started talking about how did people get into facilities management, because it certainly wasn't called that in the early stages. And people use this phrase, I fell into it, I fell into FM. So this is about the, the founding of the industry itself, principally around the core associations. Um, then people joining this nascent, uh, this, this, this embryonic industry. And then the emerging themes and trends that faced the FM industry. So sustainability was a big thing in the 60s and 70s. Emerging markets as FM grew outside the United States and Europe. Technology and other trends becoming really significant. And finally, leadership as the key uh, change agent right now. So leadership FM doesn't follow a part based structure. It follows a temporal track, if you like. It goes back to the history of the, uh, of, of the facilities management industry and then talks about the emerging themes over the years. It's not a year by year, blow by blow account of the industry, but it does conclude with the important theme of, of leadership. So it has, if you like, one overall uh, thread, one overall part, but it's, it's governed by an implicit, somewhat hidden temporal dimension. Starts off with the founding and ends up with what's important now. So there is still that, what's the current context, the start of the industry, the history, this is what we used to do, some of the emerging themes that became important and now the final theme that is important. So there's, there's an implicit hidden what's up, so what, what now. 
One structure of books that will never go away is the, the, the book with a number of steps or pillars. Um, I've talked about the seven habits of highly effective people. This is our very cheeky seven failings of really useless leaders. And there, if you like, is an inherent structure for the book already. So the seven failings of really useless leaders. What you'll find here is an introduction, learning from fa failure and why it'll help you. And then we actually put the overall inspirational leadership blueprint model. We don't want people to think that just because we're looking at failures, we're being pessimistic and downbeat. We have a positive, optimistic, upbeat model that we want to share. So we put that right at the beginning of the book. And then you'll see that although the book is divided into these chapters, they're broken down into the four personal failings and then the three corporate failings. So the sections are there, four chapters in the first section, three chapters in the second section, and look at this, the eighth failing. If Stephen Covey can have an eighth habit, we can have an eighth failing. The eighth failing has one chapter in it. So we go from four chapters in part one to three chapters in part two to one chapter in part three. So the point I want to make is don't be hemmed in by our ideas of what constitutes a table of contents. But know this, you are taking your reader on a journey. You're saying, this is where you are now. These are the things you need to take consideration of when you're looking at your, your current context. These are the options open to you, if you like, can be explicit or implicit in how you structure it. Then finally, some recommendations from you on how they need to act in the future. You also need to think about how you introduce this. You can be very pedestrian, or you can be straight in there with something quite shocking, quite grabbing their attention. We'll talk about that another time, writing the actual chapters. And then the closure, the conclusion. Remember, you need to win their hearts and minds to these recommendations that you're making. It can't just be a rational, logical explanation of what it is you think needs doing, because that's not gonna persuade anybody. So why? Do I suggest the table of contents will help you to write your book fast? Well, because it helps you to choose what to include, what to leave out. This is poking me in the, in the arm, so I'm going to just shut it down. So the table of contents will really help you to write fast because it helps you to choose what to include, helps you to know what to leave out, and it helps you to focus on what's the journey that you're taking the reader on. What's the most important journey that you could take the reader on? So that's why writing your table of contents, literally chapter heading by chapter heading, you don't have to have them finally finished. You can um, polish them and, and, and hone them as you, as you work through, but it will reduce the amount of work you have to do and it gives you a very clear starting position and it gives you a finish line that you can see in the distance. So a table of contents, writing the apparently boring table of contents that you see in every book is a profoundly useful tool to help you write your book as fast as you can, faster than you ever thought possible. I've got a lot of tidying up to do. So while I'm doing that, why don't you click subscribe unless you did already and I'll see you in the next video.